Great. Uh, so welcome, everyone. We're very happy to have uh, Annika Peter uh, giving the informal seminar today. Annika received her bachelor's from the University of Washington and her PhD at Princeton uh, before going on to postdocs at uh, Caltech and UC Irvine. Uh, she then joined the faculty at The Ohio State University in uh, 2013, where she is currently a professor of physics and astronomy. Um, Annika is visiting the Institute on and off this year as a member. Uh, so the over the course of the year. She studies dark matter and works at the intersection of particle physics and astronomy, uh, and also kind of the intersection of theory, computation, and observation. Um, and so today she'll tell us a little bit about the nuances and constraining the population of small dark matter. Okay, great. Thank you so much uh, for uh, inviting me to give a talk. Um, you know, I am having a blast being back here, which uh, is not something when I moved out of here 15 years ago, I would have thought, but I feel like I've aged into the demographic, the right demographic to super enjoy uh, Princeton as a town. And of course, it is always wonderful to be part of the very stimulating intellectual environment here. Okay, so just as a Warning. Um, let's see how bad the lag is here. All right, this was working, I swear, before. So, yeah. Okay, so a couple of caveats uh, before I get into things. I definitely have way too many slides. So this will be a little bit choose your own adventure style of a talk. So if there are things that are especially interesting to people, we could spend more time. If there are things less interesting, we'll just skip over yeah. whole portions. Um, but there are things I know that I'm definitely not going to talk about, which I'm showing on this screen here. So um, in addition to this sort of like dwarf galaxy work that I'm going to tell you about today, um, I have a couple of students, Carton Jung and Charlie Mace, who have been working on self-interacting dark matter simulations. Um, and so that's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm the uh, co-convener of the dark matter working group uh, with Rubin Observatory. So that's something I'm not gonna talk about too much today. I'm always interested in uh, direct detection and how the Milky Way's assembly history can uh, change predictions for uh, dark matter direct detection and a little bit indirect detection. Um, a big aspect of my work that I'm not gonna talk about today is solar gamma rays. That's what I talked about when I was here seven years ago. Um, and so I thought I would go back to more dark matter today. But uh, if you are interested in hearing how much uh, we have astonished solar and space physicists by uh, detecting gamma rays up to a couple of TeV from the sun. Uh, I'm happy to talk about that at a later time. And then I also really care about making sure that the future of physics is uh, different in some aspects than the way it is now. So if you want to talk about any of these things at some point during this year, I'd be happy to talk about any of these things and other stuff as well. Okay, this um, movie, which maybe ran, let me see, is um, one put together by Carton. Uh, the different lines here are density profiles of dark matter halos. Um, the different colors represent different, basically central densities of dark matter halos. And what we're seeing here is the onset of the gravothermal catastrophe in dark matter if you have dark matter self-interactions. So uh, anyways, if you're interested in learning more about that, I'm happy to chat later. Okay, so just to orient ourselves, I feel ever since I baked this cupcake from scratch, mind you, uh, in 2012, I feel like contractually obligated to myself to show this uh, picture and talks. Um, and so this cupcake represents the ingredients of the universe. So things that make up you and me and all the cool things that most of us study, like planets or uh, stars and gas, um, 
or like the sprinkles on the cupcake. Kind of pretty, but really subdominant in the uh, density and mass budget of the whole thing. Um, dark energy is like the, there we go, is like the cake part of the cupcake. It is dominant by mass. Honestly, that is not my favorite thing about the cupcake, but it is big, and so we got to understand it. And then the subject of this talk is the dark matter, which is about a quarter of our the mass energy budget of our universe. To me, I don't just love dark matter, but I'm also a frosting uh, enthusiast, so I'm happy to make this connection here. Um, but dark matter plays a role in our universe that's similar to the role that the frosting plays on the cupcake. Namely, it holds, dark matter holds the baryons together to make galaxies and all the fun things that are inside of galaxies, just like the frosting holds the sprinkles of the cupcake. So we're going to lean in hard to that analogy uh, later. Okay. So let's talk about why dark matter matters to us. Okay, so um, the first reason why dark matter matters is that it shapes the growth and evolution of our universe. Okay, so this manifests itself in two ways. So why is that dark matter governs the homogeneous evolution of the universe. So in this beautiful graphic um, from NASA, um, the outline of the shape uh, is related to the uh, rate of expansion. So in a, during the inflationary epoch and during the dark energy dominated era of today, uh, this uh, shape flutes out because the expansion rate is accelerating. But over much of the history of the universe, dark matter is the dominant uh, component of the uh, mass energy budget of the universe. And so during all this era, sorry, let me see if I can get my cursor back. During all this intermediate era of dark ages, development of planets, galaxies, et cetera, dark matter is really calling the shots in terms of the homogeneous expansion of the universe. Another reason why dark matter matters is that it also governs the inhomogeneous uh, evolution of the universe. So as you know, we'll talk about a lot more, um, galaxies are born in dark matter halos. And so the assembly of galaxies is really telling you a story of the assembly history of dark matter structures. Okay. Um, Dark matter also matters because it's a window to new physics. So um, this is one of these grid plots of the particle content of our standard model. And note that there is no square for dark matter. Dark matter must uh, exist outside or beyond the standard model. So um, when we learn something about dark matter, we learn something about the broader theory in which our standard model and other things live. Okay, so there are many um, models for dark matter. So this is the um, by now famous plot by Tim Tate from the last snow mass process in 2013, illustrating different uh, theories of dark matter. I see here on the screen, so probably almost unreadable in terms of font size, but there are many theories beyond um, the standard model, and these all generally have good dark matter candidates in them. And some of these um, specific particle theories of dark matter are loosely classified into the general category of a wimp, which means weakly interacting massive particle. So imagine a particle that interacts approximately at the electroweak scale or below, and where mass of here means like GED, it plus or minus a couple of orders of magnitude in particle mass. Um, okay, what I learned at some point is that my late uh, OSU colleague Gary Steigman 
how it invented the word wimp, uh, which I thought was an interesting fact. Um, uh, okay, so we have many theories of dark matter, but we would like to know which one or ones of these are, are really describing are the actual dark matter content of our universe. So there are a number of ways that people are trying to figure out what this dark matter is. So one way people try to find out what dark matter is, is by trying to make dark matter in the lab. So perhaps the most famous example of this is at the Large Hadron Collider, where you smash protons at each other and um, look to see what comes out of the inelastic collision between protons. So the characteristic signal of dark matter at the LHC is missing energy uh, or missing momentum. Okay. All right. So another very um, popular way uh, to look for dark matter is via its destruction. So dark matter clusters, as we saw earlier, and which we'll talk about more, and in regions of high dark matter density, if dark matter is its own antiparticle, um, then it can destroy itself and produce a ton of particles, some of which we hope to see <laughs> using an experiment like the um, Fermi um, Gamma Ray Space Telescope. Okay, this has been, just this an aside, this has been an especially interesting time this week because there was a paper archived by Sten Delos and Simon White where they claim that um, actually the annihilation rate in our Milky Way and other systems ought to be much higher than we sort of as a community naively thought and that has some very interesting consequences for um, dark matter constraints. Okay. And then another sort of what I will call traditional sort of more astroparticle and particle um, method to uh, try to figure out what dark matter is by detecting it is through direct detection. Um, and in this case, you have a vat of nuclei or a tower of crystalline structures that you dig underground and you look for dark matter from our own galaxy to smack into those uh, nuclei and send that nucleus flying, or in some cases, electron. Um, now to give you a sense of scale for like a WIMP type dark matter particle, what we're really looking for is measuring a kinetic energy that's equivalent to like a red blood cell in the capillary of your body, not like through your aorta, that's like too much kinetic energy for this, but through a capillary. Um, and you're looking for like a literal handful of these events and now multiple tons of detector material per year. Okay, and so there's a big experimental effort uh, to direct, um, to detect dark matter in this way um, and including uh, experiments that are uh, uh, being worked on by um, some colleagues at Princeton. Okay, um, but the thing that I personally have been leaning in hard to and have been leaning in harder as a function of time is by using the cosmos to learn about the microphysical properties of dark matter. And this is not a new thing. Basically, everything that we know about dark matter that we can say in the positive direction to say dark matter is this or dark matter behaves like this instead of saying dark matter is not or dark matter um, does not interact this way comes from the cosmos. Okay, um, so for example, the fact that um, we know what the fraction of dark matter is in our universe comes from observations of the cosmos. Um, uh, the fact that we can set bounds on how it interacts with the standard model, um, those, uh, those constraints were also originally set by the cosmos. Okay, so 
Um, the theme of this talk is going to be by measuring where dark matter is in our cosmos, we're going to find out what it is, fingers crossed, and we're going to use galaxies to do it. Okay, I know this particular image definitely agitates me as to like in what specific era I was in. Uh, okay, so um, this is the outline of my talk. And again, we definitely don't have time to do all the slides I have. So people can heckle me about what to skip over or what to go to more depth on. But it's sort of a four part outline. So we're going to talk about the connection between galaxies and halos. Uh, we're going to talk about whether we properly counted galaxies. We're going to talk about really how well do we understand how galaxies inhabit halos. And finally, we're going to talk about is our standard, standard vanilla cosmological model for dark matter a reasonable fit to observations so far? Okay, so galaxies, halos, and the nature of dark matter. Okay, so uh, there is a whole boatload of evidence now that galaxies are connected to dark matter halos in the sense that every galaxy, with the exception of tidal dwarfs, must live in a dark matter halo. So one way you can see this is by looking at the web of structure. So if you look at a simulation of a universe that has dark matter in it, like the one on the left here, and, um, and then you look at the clustering of galaxies, you find that you get a very similar set of structures, whether you had your dark matter goggles on or your galaxy goggles on. So the right thing is actual galaxy locations. This is some constrained realization or something else. So I think it actually probably came from the simulation. Uh, it's from this very nice review article by Lisa Wexler and Jeremy Tinker. But the history of doing this comparison goes back, as you know, decades. Um, but I think in this specific case, it uh, comes from simulation. OK, and so that's sort of like a statistical thing that I showed you before. We can also associate galaxies with dark matter halos on sort of individual galaxy bases. So um, one of the things that I did when I was preparing a talk um, to give in a special section at um, an American Physical Society meeting on uh, Vera Rubin's legacy is I went back and looked at some of her uh, classic papers. And one of the uh, really interesting classic papers that I looked at was um, her and Ken Ford's measurement of the rotation curve of our nearest big neighbor, Andromeda. Um, and so what they did is they used uh, Ken Ford's imaging spectra attached to a telescope that OSU at the time co-owned with Ohio Wesleyan University. So I always have to put in that plug uh, there. Uh, but they measured, um, it, uh, they uh, measured um, basically the motion of these H2 regions in the Andromeda galaxy, and then uh, converted that to um, a rotation curve. Okay, so just for scale here, um, the optical radius um, here is, you know, maybe of order eight to 10 um, kiloparsecs sort of around here. And this rotation curve still stays pretty flat out to, you know, tens of kiloparsecs. Mm -hmm. And of course, if only the only matter in Andromeda were its luminous matter, then this rotation curve should roll over here. So this is evidence even in like 1970 that um, Andromeda had something going on besides its baryons. Um, and now, thanks to uh, decades of effort, we have this model that when you see a galaxy, 
you should think of it, about it as being the tip of the iceberg, right? So the galaxy inhabits the very inner part of the halo. Its optical radius is typically only 2% of the um, burial radius of this dark matter halo. And that actually most of the galaxy, certainly by mass, but also by physical extent, uh, is made up of dark matter. Okay. Um, all right. And then the standard paradigm that we use to explain a lot of cosmological observations is this thing called this cold dark matter paradigm. So a lot of what I'm going to show you later is going to be basically a conversation between the st standard model and some variants. Uh, so our typical paradigm for cold dark matter is that it's really a phenomenological model. It's like a model for uh, how the universe um, uh, interacts with dark matter is that dark matter is not in this cold dark matter model. It's not relativistic or cold at its birth epoch. Dark matter is stable on long time scales and hardly interacts with anything beyond gravity. Now, strictly speaking, in the cold dark matter paradigm, it doesn't interact with anything <laughs> except via gravity. Um, this hardly interacts bit is important, though, for um, studying the dark matter abundance. So, for example, uh, with WIMPs or weakly interacting mass, mass of particles or QCD axions interact with us a little bit. And in the case of WIMPs, that little bit of interaction is directly related to its abundance in the universe, hence the idea of the WIMP miracle from, I guess, like the 80s. Um, Okay, but that little bit of interaction actually matters if you really care about relating dark matter par particle properties to its um, abundance in the universe today. Okay, and so this cold dark matter paradigm, you can make predictions from. So obviously you can make predictions about like, the homogeneous um, uh, expansion history of the universe, but you can also make predictions about um, these nonlinear structures called dark matter halos and what their population statistics are. So perhaps the most important prediction of this cold dark matter paradigm is that there's this hierarchy of dark matter halos, that you have relatively few large ones like this. This is a, 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 a visualization of one of the Aquarius uh, dark matter halos. Uh, from simulation. Um, so there are relatively few of these big halos. And then as you go down to smaller masses and sizes, there are more and more of these. And depending on uh, your dark matter production mechanism, uh, you get this hierarchy of scales down to, down to the eight solar masses, down to one solar mass, down to Earth masses, or even asteroid masses. It really depends on the precise uh, particle model uh, in uh, that you're considering as a function of this cold dark matter paradigm. Okay, and so in a WIMP type paradigm, uh, we expect dark matter halos, this hierarchy to go down to sort of Earth, Earth scale masses. Okay, so tests of um, this cold dark matter paradigm and all the particle theory families that live within this paradigm, um, best way to test that is to basically count ever smaller dark matter halos. Okay. And this is in contrast to non full dark matter theories um, of dark matter. So if you play around with the dark matter microphysics in any of many very fun and interesting ways, um, you tend to, in general, do funny things on small scales. So for warm dark matter models where dark matter is born like a little bit warm, a little bit non-relativistic, then you really suppress the formation of uh, dark matter halos below some specific scale. Um, you can do that if dark matter experiences late decays, and then the thing that has been very 
uh, exciting to a lot of theorists, sparked in part by a paper that Scott and other people here wrote uh, some number of years ago, which I don't probably remember, but I think it's been with it the last 10 years, is considering what happens if dark matter is so late, light that it behaves more like a wave than a particle on cosmic scales. And then you get all sorts of really fun non particle effects. Um, OK, so these things are actually, these ripples are not dark matter halos. They're basically like interference patterns, which is kind of cool. Okay. So, so different theories of dark matter make different predictions of the amount of structure on small scales. And so one of the things that we would like to do is count these structures. And one way we can do that is with galaxies. So this is another plot I took from the Wexler and Tinker review paper, where they're showing here on the bottom axis um, halo mass in solar masses, and then basically the star to halo fraction on this axis. So for dark matter halos above about 10 to the 11 solar masses, we have a bunch of different empirical ways to test the relationship between galaxies and halos. And then we can use galaxies to count dark matter halos as a function of stellar mass or halo mass. Um, OK. So this is validated by gravitational lensing, and this is great. Um, but what I and many others would like to do is we want to go smaller. We want to count smaller dark matter halos by counting even smaller galaxies. And the issue here is that um, there uh, is some uncertainty in how we associate galaxies with halos mostly because we don't yet have direct like lensing measurements to tell us how to make that matching. Um, uh, if we have time for it, I'll talk a little bit about a new effort to push weak lensing down to get us further down here. OK, but if you take a reasonable assumption about how uh, galaxies and dark matter halos are connected. Like, let's say we follow this, um, this uh, line here from this Berusia et al. universe machine uh, paper. Um, then we can get an estimate of how low we can go with galaxies. Basically, we can figure out uh, what point galaxies don't have really luminous variants anymore. Um, and so a very common way to do this is with the Milky Way. So we now, uh, I would say arguably over the past few years, we've gone from having a missing satellites problem to an almost too many satellites problem, like uh, uh, imaging surveys, which I may talk about in a bit, um, have discovered just like dozens of satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. And if you basically take a cold dark matter paradigm and try to shove a galaxy in every dark matter halo, um, what we find is that depending on precisely what the radial distribution of dark matter halos or galaxies is around our Milky Way, that we expect that galaxies have to live in halos down to certainly 10 to the 8 solar masses, but potentially they have to live in even smaller dark matter halos. And this is just by taking a uh, cold dark matter mass function and just basically shoving every known galaxy into a halo um, and doing it hierarchically. OK, so basically, if you want to count halos with galaxies, we can probably do this to about 10 to the 8 solar masses in halo mass, maybe a bit lower. OK. OK. So we're going to count halos by counting galaxies, and we think that we can get down to something like a halo mass of 10 to the 8. OK, so that was part one. Now let me talk about how we're actually going to do this. Like, have we properly counted galaxies, and do we really know how galaxies inhabit halos? OK. so. One of the plots that when I found in this paper was really 
like really resonated with me is even in our local volume, and here local volume means, depending on who you ask, but I'm gonna go with this definition here, is uh, the 11 megaparsec bubble around us. You can look at known galaxies as a function of their distance to us versus in this case, their K-band luminosity. And here you can, you know, the mass to light ratio, uh, sorry, the stellar mass to light ratio is of order unity here. So wherever you see luminosity here, you can do the mental swap of stellar mass and not be off by more than a factor of two-ish, which is good for this field. But if you look at um, uh, where known galaxies live, basically in our own backyard, you see that there's this bias. So, um, so the fainter galaxies, we on average have only detected really close. I should have moved this figure but, uh, to show just how low it goes, but we'll see it in subsequent figures. So um, down at these like sort of thousand solar luminosity scales, we basically only have found these so far really within the Milky Way scale. So we find these as satellites, galaxies that orbit our Milky Way. This was PEG-4 discovered in the DELF survey um, in this paper by Will Cerny. DELF, ha Delf has announced the discovery of six more stellar systems at the beginning of this week. Um, and so, you know, more buddies for the Milky Way. So maybe really we had a too many satellites problem. Okay, so that's what a galaxy looks like at sort of 10 to the three solar masses if it is in our backyard. Uh, Draco is, um, sort of in terms of luminosity back here, it's another satellite of the Milky Way. It is one of these points over here. And then Fornax, which is the largest of the Milky Way's intact satellites, uh, that's not a Magellanic cloud. It's hanging out here at about 10 to the seven um, solar luminosity. So one of the interesting things that you can see is that even for something like Fornax, you can see that um, you know, we're some perhaps sparsely sampling populations even within our own backyard. Um, okay. So the question is, why have we not found galaxies down here? Um, we expect if the Milky Way is surrounded by many satellites that are quite faint that there should be many more small galaxies hanging out in the local volume. So the question is why we haven't found them. Okay, so, uh, oh yeah, good question. So this is an apparent magnitude limit of uh, 15 in K-band. So yeah, it's just a straight up mag, uh, apparent mag limit. What is the Hubble way of measuring the distance? Uh, okay, great. So, right. Uh, so these are different methods of uh, finding distances to galaxies. So basically Hubble means Hubble flow, which means that you assume that, or you basically assume that whatever galaxies, this new, new galaxy is near that you basically say that it's probably just a similar distance. Uh, Tully Fisher is, you know, uh, using this relationship between the velocity of the rotation curve of the galaxy and its luminosity. And TRGB is really the gold standard for distance measurement in the local volume. Um, notably, you can't use spectroscopy in the local volume to find distances because of the peculiar motion. So you're really, um, you would be shocked at how poorly we know the distances to a lot of Messier objects and NGC objects because you have to use these stellar distance measurements. You look like you're about to ask a question, Scott, or maybe not. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So there are a couple of reasons why um, we have this missing population of galaxies. And when I say missing, it's not that they aren't there. I mean, maybe they just aren't there, but it really is more of a statement about our ability to find these than like something intrinsic, you know, that they're just not there. 
So one hint comes if you look at surface brightness versus distance. Um, okay, and so, uh, okay, so uh, if you go to a surface brightness is dimmer than about 26 magnitudes per square arc second in the B band, um, that's where like most of the Milky Way satellites live. These are also, they tend to be the really small ones. And then if you go out beyond basically Andromeda, we know of very few galaxies with surface brightness is dimmer than about 26 max per square arc second. Okay, and this, what I learned from my uh, colleague at OSU, um, uh, Rick Pokey, is basically the photographic plate limit. So a lot of these galaxies in the local volume were discovered in earlier eras of um, sky systems. Okay, and so one example of one of these very low surface brightness galaxies that we found near the uh, Milky Way is uh, uh, Roman 1. So, yeah, that, if you put that at a large distance, would be hard to uh, detect. Basically, we find Roman 1, this tiny, very low surface brightness object, by counting individual stars in Roman 1. Okay, so. Sorry, what, 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 uh, what you said around at the 26? Is so this is the photographic plate limit. So surface brightness is fainter than this. Do not pop up on the old photographic plate technology. Oh, all the traffic. Oh. Yeah. This is the most updated uh, result? So, so this is from uh, uh, three years ago. So since then, um, like more galaxies have been discovered, notably a bunch by Scott Carlston and Jenny Green's former students. Um, he found a lot more, but um, his surface brightness sensitivity goes um, a bit fainter than this, but not, like, not, not more about 27. Yes, I, I remember there's a dragonfly photo uh, array, something like that, which can go much further. Yes. Further in surface brightness. Right, so dragonfly definitely gets to much fainter surface brightnesses. The complicating thing for them is that they also have super huge pixels. And so that becomes, um, it becomes challenging when the size of your galaxy is like a pixel. Um, yeah. Uh, so that means in this whole time, we can do no better than photograph. Well, no, so now with CCDs and with, you know, telescope design where you're not getting as much scattered light. You can go lower. Um, in fact, we do, which I'll show you in a little bit. Okay, so, so you might ask then, what does the surface brightness mean? What does it mean in terms of galaxies I can find? Well, in this like night, very nice plot by Shinny Danielli, she shows that of known works in the local group where we are because of these results, stellar pops able to get to lower surface brightnesses. You can see that there is a correlation between the stellar mass of a galaxy and its um, surface brightness. Okay, so that 26 mass per square second I put here, galaxies brighter than this are easier to find. And things below this limit are hard to find. And what you can see is that the surface brightness limit basically is telling you that you also have effectively a uh, uh, stellar mass limit on what galaxies you can see. Um, and so this is like the joy and challenge of dwarf galaxies, is that they're not just dim, but they spread their light out. So they're like, you know, they're making, and often they're also really red. So it just makes them real hard to, uh, okay. So, but there's a lot of dispersion. So I'm picking two galaxies that uh, students of my group have discovered in a variety of surveys that we'll briefly just describe in a second. So this is a galaxy that I actually discovered by eye, um, which um, my student, former student Daniela um, has named Super One. It's actually, we think, a disrupting satellite of an LMC mass system, but it has a surface brightness of about 27 mags per square second. I mean, it's a pretty big dwarf. It's sort of like a four max type work, but it's just uh, really low surface brightness. Um, 
However, there are sometimes you get lucky and a galaxy scatters up in surface brightness, like this galaxy discovered by uh, my former student, Bianca Davis. And, you know, there are actually quite a number of, I think, bright in surface brightness galaxies that we have not associated with the local volume yet, that are just sitting out there waiting for someone to find. It's just that doing distance measurements of these guys is hard. So, anyways, the overall story is some of these galaxies are just genuinely hard to find because their surface brightnesses are so low. And then other ones that are easier to find, it's hard to then follow up and associate because you know, the local volume, you have to do things kind of on the, you have to use one of these stellar methods, not just spectroscopy to get uh, distances. Okay. All right, so there are a bunch of different strategies to find more galaxies and populate this part of this diagram. Uh, just moving through uh, quickly so I can just actually describe more stuff that my group is doing. Um, you do resolve stellar populations, basically uh, for nearby systems, uh, where you basically, yeah. They have sort of these lines, like uh, in distance, they look, it looks like things are really lines. Yeah, um, so these are because these are satellites of the Milky Way, and so they're just physically close to zero. And then this, this system here is the Andromeda satellite system. Yeah, that's a great question. So nearby, you can just use, pick your favorite wide field survey, and you can basically basically do color magnitude uh, diagram filtering, like what's shown in this plot, um, to find galaxies. So this was the technique pioneered by Beth Bowman and others in the mid-2000s, and now it's like the workhorse for like a lot of these um, surveys. And these data are Dark energy survey um, or, D, or dark energy survey Sloan, now Delve, which is a survey led by my collaborator, Alex Derlika Wagner, which is like a shallow survey of the southern sky. Um, but like any of these wide field surveys, it's just that the space density or the density of these objects in the sky is not huge. So you need a wide field survey. And then they're actually physically enormous on the sky. So like the half-light radii, sometimes we measure in terms of like degrees. So um, you really need a lot of tiling to even get an individual galaxy. Okay, so galaxies, I should say from the ground where you can do wider field things. Um, you can discover, again, by using resolved stellar populations, but you need deeper observations than what you get for like dark energy survey or SDSS. Um, and so there are a bunch of bespoke surveys, usually surveys um, for satellite galaxies, just because you know if you've got a big galaxy sitting in your field that it's going to be surrounded by a lot of companions. And so it's just very efficient to search for teeny galaxies as satellites around bigger galaxies. Um, you can use this result stellar pops thing in a sort of more targeted, deeper surveys. Um, and so Mad Cache, which is a survey that I'm uh, heavily involved in, we've been finding some galaxies like this little one called Mad Cache one. Okay, and then between five and 11 megaparsecs from the ground, we're really in what I call the fuzzy blob. Um, regime, or sometimes I call it the chocolate chip cookie regime, where you're sort of semi-resolved. So a few stars might pop, but mostly the galaxy is kind of diffuse. Um, and so uh, uh, then we can confirm these galaxies using space-based tip of the red giant branch um, distance measurements, or we can use basically the statistics of the fluctuation of light in these objects to get distances even with broadband ground-based data in a technique called surface brightness fluctuations, which um, Kirsten, one of my students, she is literally within days of submitting a paper on the discovery of a distance measurement to this uh, object that we call blobby. Um, okay, and then just for the sake of completeness, at larger distances, um, you get, you're in the totally diffuse regime, and then you use follow-up spectroscopy 
um, to confirm galaxies. So this is the strategy of the Saga survey, uh, for example. Thanks, Clark, and you didn't show the SDA once. Yeah, um, so I'm not going to, anyways, I could give a whole separate talk on the SPF distances, but um, uh, but this one we have confirmed by SPF. I was just saying, I was wondering in the plot, it, it didn't seem to show. Oh, that's because people have only been using SPF for dwarf galaxy volume in the past like three or four years. So this plot is from the paper from the beginning of 2019. And it's really only after that the SPF became like a big deal. Yeah, so things, part of the fun in this field is that things actually move uh, rapidly. Why is the number of uh, galaxies not increasing as uh, you move the distance? Yeah, good question. So I think um, uh, I think part of it is just, again, incompleteness in either detecting galaxies or in confirming distances. Um, that shouldn't affect things at a fixed luminosity. Right? No, I guess it does. Yeah. Shouldn't it? OK. Are the lines, there's like clustering on the right hand side of that? Is that their galaxy clusters or groups yeah. of galaxies that you're seeing? Right. So a lot of these, if you see like a line in vertical, that tells you probably that's a satellite system. Would you yeah. not expect more of those? I guess I'm surprised at how homogenous this looks. Yeah. Especially looking like nearby, everything is either at us or Andromeda. But then all of a sudden you get kind of this spray. Is that is that an observational thing? Is that because it's hard to see by, is that, di is that the fact that distance measurements are, there's large error bars on that? I think it's like all of the above. <laughs> but if you were to, if you were to do this in a simulation where you knew exactly where the distance is and you knew exactly where all the subhalos were, would you see a more clustered view or is this? Oh, actually that is a great question. And that's something that is doable in simulation and would be fun to do. So I haven't done that. Uh, I would expect to see more clustering. Because um, part of this is just like, you know, anyways, I don't want to go too much into it. But like when you're doing targeted surveys, you have to make choices. And, you know, I think what you're seeing here is in part just a map of what someone thought was interesting to target. Um, so, yeah. But that, that would be a fun exercise to do. And actually, um, yeah, I, that's a good idea. Um, okay, so just spent a lot of time on the setup. Now I'm just going to show a few things uh, which I think are cool. So, um, uh, and I could talk a lot more, especially about galaxy evolution if you're interested, but um, okay. Uh, so basically, my group, like many others, looks for tiny galaxies as satellites of bigger things. And again, that's just because you can, you have some guaranteed signal. Like, we think that if you believe in the hierarchical structure formation, then you expect to see a hierarchy of satellites around bigger galaxies. Okay. Um, so one of the efforts that I've been involved in for a number of years is called Bad Cash. Where we're specifically targeting relatively nearby low, large Magellanic cloud mass galaxies and looking for satellites around them. It's a regime that's pretty unexplored in theory space and galaxy evolution space. One reason why it's really nice to go to LMC mass systems on a practical level is that there are a lot more of them nearby than there are Milky Way mass analogs. So, you know, the field. I would say of galaxy evolution and satellites has been relatively obsessed with Milky Way-like systems because we can study our Milky Way really well. And so we want to know how weird we are. So there's been a lot of effort into studying satellite systems of Milky Ways. But actually, if you want to study satellite systems, you go to lower mass hosts, there are just a lot more of them. So you could do like really nice population statistics. You have about 10 minutes. Okay, thanks. So in that cache, um, We've been tiling um, nearby systems with Beckham or the Hyper Supreme Cam and finding galaxies like our creatively named Bad Cache 1 and Bad Cache 2. Um, my former student, Chris Garling, who's now a near field cosmology fellow at Virginia, he has written a really nice paper on um, the 
galaxy evolution of these satellites, like they're quenching histories, not just about their abundances. And what luminosity can you detect? Um, so down to like a order 10 to the 5 solar luminosities. So we're getting into the probably reionization fossil regime. Do you get many uh, global clusters as well? Ah, so that is a great question. Uh, we haven't done a deep dive on that, but uh, Aaron Romanowski, who's part of our collaboration, he's been long interested in diving deep on that. So, yeah. Um, uh, the the issue with globular clusters is that they just are like look like point sources basically, and so oh, this is yeah, yeah, and so it just. But you might need a like extra confirmation or something, right? Right. Yeah. So a nice thing about galaxies, as opposed to globular clusters, is that actually the galaxies are pretty angularly extended on the sky, and so it's you can reject a lot of background objects. It's harder to do for point sources. Anika, sorry, how many were you actually expecting? So you say there's there's seven which you have found, right? Uh, seven targets. Okay. Uh, so we haven't finished the survey yet. Um, we have uh, in total like three newly discovered faint dwarfs, but we haven't, you know, we haven't done the full thing. So stay tuned. <laughs> um, okay. So another survey. So this is actually this survey is how I got started in this. Um, and this basically existential crisis after my son was born in late 2014. And I had been doing a lot of like direct detection related theory. And I was like, these experiments don't see anything. All my work is useless. Uh, what can I do with my life now? And so uh, I talked with Dave Sand at a conference and he was like, you know, who potentially has a lot of dwarf galaxies in their data is Chris Kochanik, because in his failed supernova survey, the large binocular camera that he's using for it is pretty wide field of view. He takes a picture of the same patch of sky at least a few times a year, every year for 10 years. And so you get these really deep images and you can find nearby companions of other systems. So uh, I basically wrote an NSF proposal in like three weeks and had stomach flu during that, which was lots of fun. And it got funded. So uh, this data set and our dwarf search became sort of the thesis work of three of my students. Um, and we found about um, 10 satellites of nearby local volume galaxies, which is not a lot, but our field of view is really small. We're only sampling a small bit of the virial volume for every system. Um, interestingly, from a galaxy evolution perspective, even though most of our hosts in the sample are pretty low mass, like much less massive than the Milky Way, almost all the satellites we've been found appear to have been environmentally quenched. So that is interesting. This is just a gallery of the sort of spheroidal and D-trans type um, uh, galaxies that are in our footprints. Don't you expect, like, you are in the video series so of a bigger object, so you would expect quenching. Yes, but uh, the conventional wisdom is that ram pressure stripping is what dominates Milky Way mass systems. But um, these low mass galaxies don't have a hot halo. It turns out that they do have big star formation driven outflows, which we think is. Anyways, it's a, I could go much more into it, but I did not a priori expect for so many red galaxies. <laughs> Um, close by just because our hosts are not, their potential wells are just not big. Okay, um, we're also digging through the dark energy survey. So with uh, postdoc Indy Sardone, uh, my former student Daniela Roberts and current student Joy Bhattacharya, um, we've been mining the dark energy survey for so this is basically a map of known low surface brightness galaxies. Um, here are targets. Most of these are background objects, uh, but we have ways to get a sample of higher probability satellite candidates out of these. Okay, in the future is the Rubin Observatory. Like Rubin will cover half the sky to the depths of 
and for Supreme Chem Survey, so we should find boatloads of new galaxies there. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the very interesting thing on internal galaxy kinematics, which if you want to know more about, please ask me later. But basically, if you try to associate galaxies with halos through just counting, and do, then try to do it instead with kinematics, the internal kinematics of galaxies, and try to map that to the halo, you tend to get very different answers of how to associate galaxies with halos. And so Amy Sardone and Alison Brooks and I think we have cracked the reason why. Um, so you can ask me about it later. Let me just get back to the um, thing about how, how is CDM holding up? How is our standard model holding up? Okay, so the answer is it's doing pretty well. So my former student, Chris Garling, has been doing some basically semi-analytic modeling to try to basically be able to likelihood functionize our whole operation. Um, and basically, we're finding um, pretty good agreement with CDM plus cosmology theory, although the error bars are still large. This is a plot that will appear in a paper that should be out within a week or two um, about the uh, LBT SAR survey, where this line here is our theory prediction for the satellite luminosity function here expressed in a magnitude difference between the host and satellite. And then these points are what we actually find. So there's maybe a little tension, but the error bars are still a little big. That's the reason why we want to go to bigger surveys. Um, I also was involved a bit in Jenny Green and Scott Carlson's um, ELVES survey, where it's basically another recycling program where you take existing data and try to find satellites. And we also find good agreement. And then going back to the Milky Way, uh, my former student Stacy Kim and I have had a couple of papers where we're basically looking for. In this case, we looked at the cumulative mass function of satellites in the Milky Way, uh, which are represented by these colored lines, and then comparing it just to basically scaling relations between galaxies and halos, uh, which is best represented by this gray line here. And we are finding pretty good agreement between the number of satellites around the Milky Way and just vanilla whole dark matter theory. One flag I'll put in is if you add kinematic information for the satellites, you can actually do better than just with luminosity counts alone. And that's because the internal velocity of a galaxy tells you something about the gravitational potential of where you are. And so even if you have the same mass function of dark matter halos, if, if either baryons or dark matter physics changes the gravitational potential in the inner part of the galaxy that really manifests itself in the velocity function of satellites. So um, here in this gray region, we have the observed velocity function. This is the line of sight velocity dispersion within an individual dwarf on this axis. And this is the cumulative number count. There is a huge observational uncertainty mostly driven by the fact that we don't actually know what the radial distribution of satellites should be. And our best fit CDM model is this orange line where um, we have a little bit of uh, stripping of dark matter halos, and also we have cores in massive satellites, but not in less massive satellites. And interestingly, if you have dark matter self-interactions, it can really change the central density and thus potential even if you leave the halo mass function alone. And so these different lines represent different cross sections for dark matter, which you should read as different um, central densities and thus different predicted velocity dispersions of stars in that potential. And we find that we can really sharply constrain the self-interacting cross section just with this velocity function um, in combination with uh, some luminosity function. Data. Anyways, all of this is to say that whole dark matter looks pretty good. Um, and that comes from a bunch of different studies of our Milky Way and systems beyond the Milky Way. So I'm going to end there. Um, 
you know, I am, I would love for Dork Router to not be as quote unquote boring as CDN, but so far the paradigm is holding up more robustly than I would have expected. There's of course a lot of wiggle room and our error bars are large, but stay tuned for Ruben Observatory and beyond. All right, thanks. Thank you for staying on time. Um, we have time, maybe like a, a few minutes before lunch for any questions. Uh, so I noticed your conclusion says you're achieving consistency between abundance matching and kinematics, but I thought you said a few minutes earlier that you were getting different answers from the kinematics and the photography. Okay, good. So that is the audience point to let me talk about the thing that I didn't uh, help type. So historically, there has been an issue that when you try to be yeah, kinematics for like um, what I will call mid-sized works, try to associate galaxies with halos. Um, basically, for a lot of dwarf galaxies that still have gas at where you can measure rotation curves, historically, we have not been able to get to what's called the flat part of the rotation curve. Um, and even if you have like single booth radial observations, those are really most sensitive to the high column density material um, and, you know, really the peak of the velocity curve is coming from where you have pretty low column density material. So because of basically observational effects, we haven't been able to really get to where the rotation curve is flat and getting to the flat part is important because the flat part of the rotation curve is really set by the dark matter halo mass. So people have been trying to associate galaxies with halos, basically by using these observations where there's relatively high column density, but where we're not quite up to the flat part. So what do you do then? Um, there have been a number of things people do, but usually, um, but usually you have to make some kind of assumption about either the shape of the dark matter halo or you basically, anyways, there are a bunch of assumptions you have to make to take the velocity that you see to try to extrapolate it to a dark matter halo. And so one of the things that um, we've been doing, um, so this is a collaboration between um, Amy Sargonis, an NSF perspective fellow at OSU, and she's a radio astronomer, and Allison Brooks, a simulator just up to one at Rutgers, is that we've been getting very, very deep single dish observations of pretty small galaxies. These are all in stellar mass, definitely below 10 to the 7. And what we've been doing is having really high spectral resolution and um, just we sat on each object with the Parkes telescope for two hours. And we get these really beautiful um, uh, basically spectral lines of H1 emission. Now, these are deep enough that we think that we can get to something close to the, um, the halo set rotation of these galaxies. So this is a plot of the sort of flat part of the rotation curve as uh, for dark matter halos. Um, and uh, this is, the measured um, uh, rotation, or you know, basically a measure of the velocity of rotation velocity of a system, um, uh, and uh, these different points, the different colors represent basically how far in the wings you're going to explore the emission. So for a Milky Way mass galaxy, you get this spectral feature that looks like this double form. And so people use this thing of W50, which is figuring out where the line is half from the peak to measure the rotation velocity of the galaxy. It turns out that's a really bad measure of the rotation velocity of the dwarf. And so you basically have to go further out in the wings of the spectral line to get to the low column material, which is near the flat part of the rotation curve. So here we're doing W10, which is where the, the Flux drops by a factor of 10 from the peak. And when we do that, we find that we get good agreement between the 
expected halo velocity and the you know rotation of the galaxy. All these squares are from Allison simulation. So we're finding the same sort of trends in observations as simulation. So basically the TLDR here is to really get to the rotation, you know, to get a reasonable estimate of the halo mass, you either have to make a very deep observation of the galaxies to really get out to the very low column material or use Allison simulations to convert from things that are easier to measure, like W50, to the actual rotation curve of the galaxy. So that was kind of a long-winded answer, but to say that you really have to measure the flat, you know, you have to have an observation where you really get to the flat part of the rotation curve or really trust your extrapolations. And then you get agreement. And so is there other burning questions thinking about now. I just want to say that we will be going out to dinner um, early today. So if the reservation will be at 5 p.m. Uh, because of observing constraints. So I think we have like one spot left for that. So if you're interested, uh, let me know soon. Um, otherwise, any other burning questions? Uh, and if not, then uh, we'll go to lunch. We can kind of like say nothing.